nobody like, nobody like you, my Jesus. Nobody like, nobody like you. Nobody like, nobody like, nobody like you, my Jesus. Nobody like, nobody like. To be light, move to action, full of mercy and compassion. Hearts say yes, Lord. Come take control.
Why don't we stand? Come on in if you're out in the foyer. Welcome those of you that are streaming with us online. Glad you're with us. Well, hey, happy 4th of July weekend. Hope you've got some uh, festivities planned, or maybe it's just relaxing, but I hope you're able to do that. We're going to open our service as we're in the tradition of doing, praying for another church here in the great state of Maine. So today we're actually down in the Saco Biddeford area. This church actually was a, a church that originated out of this church. I mean, it was a church, that, a congregation that started from folks that came here. Uh, Jenna and Sean Stepp planted the Saltwater Vineyard Church a few years ago now. So let's uh, pray, pray for them if we would today. Lord, we thank you for this community of faith. We pray blessing upon them. Lord, even as they meet right now, we pray you just pour your spirit out upon them. Lord, we thank you for their commitment to the Saco Biddeford area. Lord, I pray that salt water just become entrenched, Lord, and uh, become yet another uh, just long-standing community of faith that meets the, just the real felt needs, spiritual and, and, and physical, of those in that area. Bless them. Keep them inspired through your word and your spirit. And Lord, we ask for that as well here today, Lord. We know you're here. Uh, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and make your presence known to us. We offer you this time of worship and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, look to your neighbor. Wish him a happy 4th of July weekend. Let's, uh, let's worship. This is what freedom feels like. 
is your faithfulness and I will rest in your promises my confidence oh is your faithfulness and I will rest in your promises my Sing that one more time. We're going to sing, I will rest in your promises. And I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. I will rest. Sing it again if you need to. In your promises. Thank 
king forever, yes. You storm the gates of my heart. Yes, God. The veil in between was torn apart. Now you hold the keys to the grave. As you bring things to life, you roll storms away. All praise to the Lord most high. All praise to the one who saved my life. All praise to Jesus Christ, my King of heaven, my King forever. All praise to the Lord most high. All praise to the one who saved my life. All praise to Jesus Christ, my King of heaven, my King forever. Oh, forever. All praise to Jesus. 
once asked by a friend, uh, like, doesn't it get repetitive saying the same thing like hallelujah all the time? And you know, we both are fathers. And I just said, do you ever get sick of hearing your child tell you I love you? It's just one of those things I think about. Did you 
good? Amen. You're good. All right. <laughs> you got it. Go with it. Well, Father, we do thank you for this opportunity to gather, Lord. I just even, uh, just standing in this presence, Lord, uh, being led by this team, uh, being uh, in a gathering of people singing these songs of praise, it's, uh, Lord, it, it just such a, a, a sense in my heart of uh, almost being overwhelmed with, like, this is what we were created for. This is what we're meant to do to be in the presence of the Lord around the beauty of his creation, that being his people. And Lord, so I don't know where everybody's at today, Father, but I pray that in a sense that each heart here would be undone by your presence today, Lord. No matter how near or far people have felt from you or even when they woke this morning, how near or far they have felt from you, I pray that you would just undo them with your presence today, Lord. Pour your spirit out upon us, God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, you may be seated for a minute. We are going to uh, continue uh, with worship this morning by doing a baby dedication. So if uh, Viviana and the parents would come up. Beautiful little Yay. baby. Viviana Lacey Escobar, strong name, good name, oh my gosh, what nationalities are represented here? Hispanic. Hispanic. Yeah. Is she going to be bilingual? Yes, oh, yes. definitely. <laughs> well, I wanted to do something a little bit different today, I've been uh, thinking about you guys, I know we've been working out the details for a couple weeks to... Uh, to dedicate Viviana, and I just, I felt impressed by uh, the Lord this morning that we actually do this in both Spanish and English, if you guys are okay with that. So I'm, I'm going to invite Phil and Jan to come up, if they would. Um, you know, we we have been so fortunate to uh, to see God blending together cultures here at Pathway and, um, and that's to be celebrated. And, you know, the, the heritage, I think the first time I met you, I talked to you and I said, hey, how'd you find out about Pathway? You said, I think you said your grandmother, your mother brought you here when you were little. Yeah. And man, this is now, you're paying forward what has been invested in you. Absolutely. And that's why we do this. You know, I, I, we were fortunate enough to do this a few weeks. I got to do this as a grandpa a couple of weeks ago. It was special. But my parents did this with me. And then I did this with my kids. And then you can see how God is faithful through the generation. So it's no small assignment that God has given you in this precious child. It's a privilege, but with that privilege is a great responsibility too. And um, her, like all of our children, have the greatest opportunity to see Jesus reflected through your guys' lives. And the way that you behave, the way that you interact with one another, the, the lessons that you teach her... And, and so we're going to pray over Viviana today, but we're also going to pray over you as parents. So I'm going to pray for you as parents, and then I'm going to invite Phil and Jan, because they speak Spanish, if they would. You have a microphone uh, to, to pray um, in, in Spanish. So Lord, I thank you for this family, Lord God. Would you guys extend your hand towards this family? Lord, I pray blessing over them. Lord, I pray as parents, as caregivers, Lord, that you would give them all the wisdom and the courage and the strength that they need. Lord, I pray that you would give them insight into what you have formed in this precious child you've given them, and that you would give them all the tools that they need to uh, speak into her life and draw out from her, Lord, those very things that you've placed within her. Lord, for us and for grandparents and for parents and those that can also contribute, Lord, may we do our part in cheering on this family and modeling Christ to her. So we pray blessing over her, and now we will bless her. Cada día, Señor, por favor, que darle sabiduría. Sabiduría cuando llegan los momentos que no saben qué hacer. Señor, que tú les das coraje. Coraje, ambos padres, coraje de levantar, preparar, enseñar, 
Viviana. El camino, la vida en ti, Señor. Y Señor, que les da gracia. Oramos por gracia sobre la vida de Viviana. Que ella tenga, Señor, un corazón precioso, moldeable. Señor, que ella tenga también, aunque pequeña, sabiduría, coraje, bondad. Llénales. Los padres, bendíceles. Bendice esta familia. Bendice, Señor, este matrimonio. Y oramos en tu nombre. Y gracias, Señor, porque sabemos que los hijos son un regalo de Dios. Son una bendición. Y hoy día, todos juntos estamos orando una gran bendición sobre la vida de Viviana. Y sobre este matrimonio que el Señor les cuida, les ayuda y les bendice cada día, cada año. En el nombre de Jesús. Amén. Amén. Amen. Bless you guys. You're welcome. You're welcome. We have a gift for you guys, and Michelle has the uh, dedication. This is Miss Michelle, our children's pastor, so you'll probably get familiar with her. She was, she saved my life, so. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. We could just stare at her all day. We could do <laughs> now, I know I just set a precedent with the language thing, so, but you're going to have to help me out if we do that going forward, okay? Well, thank you guys. You know, and it's such a privilege to, to dedicate these kids. And I really do believe, I know, I know in my own life, my kids are now 26 and, and uh, 28 and grandkids here, but... Uh, I know the difference it makes to have a community of faith around to raise children. So it, it is a worthwhile endeavor, endeavor and way to live life. Um, you know, I, we'll move on now. I think that uh, I'm supposed to do the rest of the, uh, the, the show here. So, um, yeah, okay. So if uh, you came today with a tithe or an offering and you would like to contribute it uh, on your way out, there's some boxes by the doors, you can do that. Also, uh, the majority of people give online now, and that information every week is flashing onto the screen how you can actually uh, catch up with the 21st century and give electronically if you like. So uh, you could do that. Uh, and then I think Jeremy has some announcements for us to watch if you want to take a look at the screens. Now somebody Jeremy, asked us to do it in Burundi, we're in trouble. <laughs> if you're new here, we would love to connect with you. If you're tech savvy, you can scan this QR code with a smartphone camera and fill out that connect card right from your phone. If you prefer paper and pen, we have connect cards right at the info booth. Regardless of which way you'd like to connect with us, come to the info booth after the service. We would love to meet you and to give you a gift just to say thank you for checking us out today. Hello, my name is Malik Hall. On July 8th, 6.30 p.m., head to the Brunswick campus for our women's flower potluck. I like lilies, roses, and tulips if anyone wonders. Learn the floral design basics as ladies from our campus gather in Brunswick for a fun connecting event. For more details, see the Church Center app or our website. Kids Unleashed is back, happening July 11th through the 15th. For kids going through first grade through sixth grade, I got that right, Teresa. We are gearing up for an incredible week, playing hard and teaching kids how to walk with Jesus. Sign up your kids on the Church Center app or on their website. If you would like to volunteer and help change the life of a child this summer for a day, maybe two, maybe you want to do the whole week, just, just sign up. Make sure you go to the Church Center app or our website. Hey, we are working on a creative project that celebrates diversity of the people that call Pathway their church. And we need your help. If English is your second language, and I only speak one, just to be clear, we want to hear from you. Simply open the Church Center app, click on Contact Us button, and then write your native language in the subject line. 
you also can write it down and give it to Jenny at the info. And for our final segment, did you know that this is 4th of July weekend? Of course you did. But did you know that Americans eat more hot dogs on the 4th than any other day of the year? Over 150 million hot dogs will be eaten on Monday. The record holder for the most dogs eaten on the 4th goes to Joey Chestnut, who ate 76 hot dogs in the bun in just 10 minutes. So, turn to the person near you and tell them whether you like regular hot dogs or the main favorite, red hot dogs. And as always, we hope you feel welcomed and loved here at Pathway. Americans also lead the world in obesity too, just so you know. <laughs> but enjoy a hot dog. <laughs> Well, good. It's good to be with you. We are actually doing, I'm very excited about a creative uh, project that we're doing. Uh, you know, we, I did a little bit of remodeling during uh, the pandemic when we had no people in here. We put a new rug in here. We got rid of the furniture with all the plans of getting new furniture out in our foyer. And we're slowly doing that, incorporating some great pieces from around the state. But we also have, a, we have uh, some visual, a visual project that I, uh, I want to do. And so I'm making everybody do it. And uh, it really is uh, going to bring together a blending of, of all the different people that God has brought here to Pathway. So I, we really mean this. If, if English is your second language, or if there's a, another language that has influenced you, been spoken in your home, would you please tell us what that is? And then we're going we're gonna to draw from you a phrase that we want to know how it's said and, and communicated in your language. And then we're going to represent that uh, out in our foyer. So we'd love for you to help us participate with that. I, like Malik, uh, I speak, uh, barely speak English. Uh, I know if you've listened to me for years, you know I regularly make up words up here on this platform, but uh, I, I try. So we're in a series in 1 Corinthians, and we're actually coming towards the end of it. You know, we've got this week, and then two more weeks. We'll finish up chapter 15 next week, and then look at chapter 16, and then be done our journey through this letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church that he had a level of influence and leadership among, uh, really trying to help the church get recentered on who it, who it is that they were called to be as the people of God. They've kind of lost their way. They've allowed too much cultural influence, uh, the wisdom of culture as opposed to the wisdom of God, to infiltrate the community. And in doing so, it created a high level of disunity. And, and the church is on the verge of, of losing the effectiveness of its witness and its mission. So Paul, being a good pastor, comes along, writes this letter to them, really as an exhortation and encouragement to, guys, get, get back on the path that God has laid before you. We, as the 21st century church, really have a lot to learn uh, from what was going on in this community of faith. Last week, uh, Jeremy and uh, myself in Brunswick and Pauline and Gray uh, just began to uh, show that Paul was now addressing some of the theological breakdown that had weaved its way into the church in Corinth. When we think of theology, we're, we're talking about what it is that we believe about God. And as Christians, it's what we believe about God as informed through Scripture. Remember last week we, we mentioned that in two places, Paul makes his defense of, on what he's talking about by saying, guys, in Scripture it says... In Scripture, it says, and, and so Paul is, again, appealing to them to hold on to the tenets of their faith, to not get tossed to and fro by whatever is the cultural fascination of the philosophy of the day, but to take their cues for navigating life as informed by the Word of God. Some were departing from the tenets of the faith, and they were mixing a version of Christianity with the false religions and the philosophies of the day. And they had developed what we call, today we would call that, they had developed a low view of scripture. So to the scriptures as they had it, they began to look at them as though the scriptures perhaps held some truth, but were not the truth. We're not the, the, the ultimate source, source of truth. And we, we began talking last week about our need uh, uh, for a high view of scripture. Now, a high view of Scripture means that Scripture for us is the authoritative, authoritative source, authoritative source of authentic Christianity. It is our moral and spiritual guide. 
It is our ethical compass. It's the source of truth that keeps us attuned to both the heart and the will of God. In a sense, it's also God's love letter written to his creation to help us understand how to reconnect with him after we face what we lost at the fall of, of, of creation. And so for us, the word of God becomes that actual source of authority that guides our life. When we think of relationships, when we think of how we parent, like what we just did with Viviana, why do we do that? Scripture encourages us to raise a child in the way should, that they should go. Scripture encourages us to keep the scriptures, you know, our kids in tune with the, the scriptures and the, the word of God. So when we look at the world and we think of how do I interact with my neighbor, when we look at the world and think of human uh, sexuality, when we think of the the sanctity of life, for the Christian, the the source of authority becomes the Word of God, the Holy Scriptures, the, the Bible. Conversely, when we allow culture and whatever its current fascination is, philosophies of the day, when we allow those to define which portions of scripture we, we hold as truths and which we set aside because they don't align with our desires or our preferences, we then head down a dangerous slope of deconstructing our faith. You know, again, Paul is writing this to the church. You know, I, I wouldn't say that, that a non-Christian is probably going to deconstruct their faith if they don't have faith in Jesus. But Paul's saying to the church, when you begin to remove some of the essential, the, the core truths, the foundational truths of our faith, when you begin to remove those from your belief system, you deconstruct your faith, you leave yourself a, being a shallow version or, or possibly even a contradiction of who it is that God has called you to be. And it's a very slippery slope to go down. So we will look at the specific problem that had arisen in the church in Corinth and then talk a little bit about what uh, today's progressive Christianity would like us to believe in terms of deconstructing our faith. The issue at Corinth, as we began to see last week, was, was centered upon the, the whole uh, truth around the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, the culture of the day, there were many false religions in this pagan society, and they believed in spirits and gods and things like that, but their gods were deities that did not have human form. And and in the Christian church, we actually believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead. Didn't just rise in spirit Casper the ghost form but actually was in physical form, flesh and blood, Jesus rose from the dead, and as we saw in last week's text, over 500 witnesses saw the risen Christ. And Paul is helping them understand, guys, this is kind of foundational to our faith. If we begin to deviate from this, what are we really left with? He says it this way in 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 12. He says, I'm reading from, uh, from the New Living Translation today. I just like the way it flowed. He says, but tell me this. Since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then All our preaching is useless, and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there's no resurrection of the dead. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless, and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. And so Paul is using this very uh, poignant language to try to help them understand that, guys, just, just because you know, culture has maybe moved on from this thought of the resurrected Christ doesn't mean we take our cues from culture. 
No, we revisit what the foundation of our faith is built on, and we believe by faith even if we stand alone. And he's encouraging them to, to reconnect. But in this culture, uh, one, one theologian says it this way of kind of what the, the climate of the day was, the atmosphere. He says, some in Corinth have supposed that to say the Messiah was raised from the dead was simply a fancy first century, first century way of saying God, God's cause continues or I still regard Jesus as my leader and teacher. So some are trying to say, well, the resurrection didn't really happen. What we're saying by saying there was a resurrection is we're really just saying, no, no, I, even though Jesus is gone, I still follow him. I, I, I still believe him. The writer goes on to say, he says, that's all very well if Christianity was simply a set of ethical, ethical commands or if Jesus is simply one guru among others teaching a way to God which one could follow or, or choose not to. He says, there are some today who want Christianity to be that sort of thing. It is, after all, much less demanding on several levels. Right? If, if Jesus isn't quite who he claimed to be, it, it's a little less intense, this whole walk with Jesus thing. He says, sometimes the desire that Christianity should be this sort of thing has even uh, been made, uh, has made a reason for denying that Christ was raised from the dead. And this author says, uh, we, one person said to him once, we can't say the resurrection happened because that would make Christianity different from all other faiths. Bingo. It is different than all other faiths because Jesus rose from the dead. Right? It, it's unlike any other faith that points to it, points to our desperate need for a savior and that we had no capacity to, to, to get eternal life absent from the work of Jesus Christ. Paul says, yeah, it is exclusive. It's all inclusive. It's for whoever will call on the name of Jesus, but it is very exclusive. It is unlike, and we can't apologize. Um, you know, it's another conversation. My brain just went down a path that it should not go. But let me say this. Because, let me say this. Because something in Scripture doesn't make sense to our finite or limited understanding doesn't mean that we try to explain it away like it never happened or it isn't true. Like, I don't understand resurrection from the dead. Like, I, I literally have prayed for those who have died tragically prematurely and have not witnessed the resurrection of the dead. But in my limited understanding, I, don't, I then don't just say, well, because I ain't seen it, I don't believe it. That's not faith. Faith is believing in that which we have not yet seen. And we put our hope in that, that the promises of God are true, will be true, we are seeing them, we will see them. See, a foundational truth of Christianity is that you and I were born into sin, and the penalty for that sin was death. We had no capacity to free ourselves in of our own. We then, as Christians, go on to believe, as informed by Scripture, that Jesus was not satisfied with us dying, so took our death penalty upon himself by surrendering his life on the cross. We, in turn, accept what he did, and he, in turn, defeated death by rising from the grave, a physical and spiritual resurrection before he ascended to be with the Father. Denying the resurrection empowers us to really then establish a thought base that death wasn't necessary for sin. So we don't really need a savior, do we? I mean, if Jesus works for you, it's great. But don't impose that on me. Like, I, I've got another path. And when we begin to allow that cultural thought to infiltrate the orthodoxy of our makeup as the Christian church, it's no wonder that people are left scratching their heads. I don't really know what to believe. Scripture keeps us centered. Scripture keeps us attuned to the heart and will for God. 1 Corinthians 15 goes on to say, in verse 20, says, Paul says, but in fact, again, he's looking at the church, he's writing this letter, he's being emphatic here, he's saying, church, Christ has been raised from the dead. 
He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. And I, I'm not going to, I don't want to get lost. I got lost first service and the rest of the text there. But Paul, Paul is reminding them here the foundational truth of the resurrection and the effect that it had on our death problem. Take out the resurrection. You say, I'm not comfortable with the resurrection because I, I like wasn't around when Jesus rose, so I, I can't really say. So I'm not comfortable with that portion of scripture, so I'm just gonna, I don't, I don't think I'm gonna believe that part. Well, you exclude the resurrection, then Paul is saying you have nothing left to take that, that is going to take care of your death penalty. There's nothing, there's no substitute. It's not, it's not just a moral code you follow. If I'm just good enough, I'll get in, right? If God's a God of love, then come on. If he's a God of love, we're all okay. What does the scripture say? Paul would say, and I'll say as a 21st century pastor, what does the scripture say? Don't hinge your bet on whatever the philosophy of the day is. What does scripture say? Paul's saying if we call into question the resurrection, then every other essential truth of our belief system becomes free game to call in question. Was Mary really a virgin? Come on. We know how these things work. It just was convenient. She hooked up with her boyfriend. God had an opportunity to explain that pregnancy. It's the same or lie to original sin. That the world, want, culture wants us to believe the same lie that Satan tempted Adam and Eve with. Does God really say? Did he really mean you couldn't eat from that? And when we take that bait, it's no wonder why we're left in this just path of confusion. And sadly, we have people that at one point walked with Jesus but then because they began to just get fascinated with whatever the philosophical debate amongst culture was, that became more captivating, and they sadly jettison the foundations of their faith and end up a shell of who God intended them to be. Drop down to verse 30, Paul it says in his argument, like he's, in a sense he's saying, guys, if this isn't true, okay? If this isn't true, verse 30 says, uh, why should we ourselves risk our lives hour by hour? Right? In a sense, he's saying, if this isn't true, why, why are we doing what we're doing? You know, first of all, if this isn't true, all of us apostles are lying, and we've just been duping all the believers in Christ. But he says, and why, why should we risk our lives hour by hour? For I swear, dear brothers and sisters, that I face death daily. Like Paul's like, I've put my life on the line for this. If this isn't true, why would I do that? He says, this is as certain as my pride in what Christ Jesus our Lord has, has done to you and what value was there in fighting wild beasts, those peoples in Ephesus, if there will be no resurrection from the dead and if there's no resurrection, let's feast and drink for tomorrow we die. And that philosophy continues to exist in society today, right? Like, if, if we don't have an anchor, if we don't have, if we don't have that plumb line of, of, of just the roots of our faith being rooted to, you know, the foundations of, of Christian truth, then what does any of this matter? Why do we even care? Why do we care how we treat other people? Why do we care what, you know, the craziness in the world and, and, and the violence? What does it matter? Let's just, would you just eat and drink because tomorrow we're all going to die anyways. And sadly, a lot of people subscribe to that, that philosophy. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It does matter. I think inherently, I think that's a lie. If somebody says, it doesn't matter. Like, what does it matter? What does it matter what I do? It doesn't affect you. And what does it matter? Like, just live for the moment. You know, that's a wonderful philosophy as long as you're doing what you want to do. But if, if, if we just say live for the moment, somebody's moment might be to cause great harm to you. You okay with that? That's foolishness. No, it, it matters what we believe. And it matters that we, we hold on to the, the tenets of our, our faith, those ancient truths that have been passed down generation to generation. I can almost hear Paul, you know, 
you know, using his best uh, coach Bill Belichick voice. Like, you know, Belichick's always like, you know, uh, do your job. In a sense, Paul's like, church, do your job. I can hear him now saying, what, what are we doing here, guys? Like, we're just going to start removing foundational truths of our faith because, you know, it makes, us, it makes us more comfortable with society. And that really is part of what is at risk here. It's part of what's at risk today and, and part of the, the, the problem with, with, with the church wavering on the truths of our faith is some people are realizing that at times to be a Christian makes you downright uncomfortable and we don't like to be uncomfortable. We don't like to be the, pers- the odd person in the room that thinks differently from our friends and our co-workers. So it's often easier to say, well, I'm not sure if the Bible really means that, so... That's a sl- slippery slope, guys. It'll leave, it'll, especially if the church begins to subscribe to it. The church being the, the hope of the world, the image bearers of Christ. If we lose our nerve, if we lose our way, we lose the effectiveness of our mission. Paul then takes a very parental stance here in his writing, and he, he looks at the church. And, and again, when I say he looks at the church, I'm talking about him writing the letter um, that the church will be given. But in verse 33, he says to the church, Church, don't be fooled by those who say such things, for bad company corrupts good character. Right? How many a parent has used that one? So we know it to be true. You know, I can think of the influences in my life that per, probably were not the healthiest influences me and where I allowed myself to make kind of moral and ethical compromise because of those that I was surrounding me with, myself with. In a sense, Paul's saying to the church, you know, yet, you know it's that whole be, be in the world but not of the world, right? That, that guys, don't, don't be careful what you allow to in, influence you and captivate your thought and your attention. He says in verse 34, think carefully about what is right and stop sinning. For to your shame I say that some of you don't even know God at all. In a sense, just as parental Paul here saying, guys, pay attention to what you're allowing yourself to be influenced by. Let it be rooted in scripture. This idea of uh, 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 a new way of Christianity still floats around in culture today. Uh, you know, it's cloaked in, in what's called progressive Christianity today. Uh, and it's just another way of trying to explain away the difficult things of Scripture or the things that press back against the th- uh, our natural desires or preferences. So it's just easier to kind of just uh, 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 write them off. Uh, let me just give you some examples, and we're going to lean more into this next week. But uh, I'll give you a little bit of thought of what this, what this uh, philosophy uh, sounds like in terms of progressive Christianity. Um, because we, like the church in Corinth, have to be attentive to what's trying to influence us. We have to avoid falling prey to false narratives uh, while we learn how to gracefully yet compellingly push back often to what culture is offering, offering us. We don't need to ever push back uh, just with blatant anger. You know what the world doesn't need more of? Angry Christians. That's not going to save the moment. It's not going to win the day. But we do need to know how to gracefully, uh, to be able to take our stand and say, no, this, uh, I'm sorry, this is an area I will not compromise on. Why? There's a sweet little song we taught our children. Jesus loves me, this I know. Why? Because the Bible tells me so. That's a stupid little nursery rhyme. No, I believe it. I believe it. Like pathway, we're sticking with the scriptures. And I hope you do too. But today's progressive Christianity sounds something like this. I have various authors here that I'll read. I can give you the, the, the sources if you like. Progressive Christians believe that Jesus isn't so much the divine son of God, but rather just one of many moral examples for us to follow. Jesus is more of like a, a big brother that sets a pattern that, that, that we can walk in his footsteps. And we do follow Jesus' examples, but progressive Christians say that Jesus is just a picture of what we can be and what we can do, but he's just one picture of many. And the lowering of Jesus is the first mark of progressive Christianity. And, and, and the, the problem with this is that um, the Bible has some pretty authoritative things to say about who Jesus is. So th- this is the best, way, the best way to interpret Scripture is how? Use scripture. 
Let the Bible interpret and back up itself. And so when it comes to Jesus, you know, the, the progressive society would just say, no, no, he has some good things to say. No, but he's kind of like, you know, a like Gandhi or, or, you know, like a, a you know, kind of like a, a, a Buddhist, uh, you know, a good uh, Hindu priest. And it was, you know, he had a lot of good things to say, wise things to say, but certainly, you know, he's not like the only way to like attain a, a higher standard of living or, or even some type of afterlife. Well, the problem with that thought is the Bible has some pretty powerful things to say about who Jesus is. Jesus himself has some pretty exclusive things to say about who he is. Remember this one, John 14, 6? Jesus answered, I, I, Jesus says, speaking of himself, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. Now, that either paints Jesus to be a liar, a lunatic, or he's actually the Lord. That it, that's actually true of him. And, and so we, again, we look at Scripture, and we as Christians do not have the luxury to begin to soften our stance on who Jesus is. Yeah, you know, he was born of God. He, he, he was probably the human being that understood the heart of God better than anybody else. But I don't know if we can say he was God. You start hearing those conversations, run. Head the other way. Because the Bible says in Acts 14, Paul, speaking of Jesus, Paul says of Jesus, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Pretty exclusive. All inclusive, but pretty exclusive. See, the problem in culture today and the problem, if we're not careful within the church, is we read those and we think, but God, my friends don't feel that way. And so we begin to make a little bit of compromise because we don't like to be the odd person in the room. Hey, if you're gonna be a Christian, you're gonna be the odd person in the room. Embrace it. Embrace the awkwardness because you just may help save someone's life. Progressive, in the progressive church, they, they, they hold the Bible in a low view of authority. The Bible is viewed more like an ancient spiritual travel journal than the inspired authoritative word of God. Bible writers, the, the Bible writers are viewed as well-meaning ancient people who were doing their best to understand God in the times and places in which they live, but they were not necessarily speaking for God. Scripture is also seen as contradictory, not internally coherent, and not authoritative for Christians. Again, the only problem with this is Scripture has a pretty high opinion of itself, right? 1 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, for training in righteousness. All Scripture. Romans 15.4 says, For whatever was written in the former days was written, speaking of Scripture, was written for our instruction, and through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. You really want to be an agent of hope? Keep the scriptures rooted to your core. Progressive Christianity teaches this idea that people aren't really fallen and that they're not really bad, that there's nothing, anything really marring us, that we're all just really good at the core and therefore we have the opportunity to, to be even better. You'll find that in progressive Christian circles, there's a downplaying of the word sin and there's certainly no interest in talking about the wrath of God on sin. God is not portrayed at all uh, disturbed or upset with sin. And again, as we look at the tenets of our faith, those foundational truths, um, you know, what, what we believe as Christians is that we're all born inherently with a sin problem. We all can demonstrate good because we're all created in the image of God, so we have this capacity to be good, but we cannot jettison from the foundations of our faith that, no, we're all just good, and sometimes we just ca get caught up in other people's bad actions or bad habits. No, we, we get caught up in evil and, and, and bad habits because we're born inherently sinful and desperately needed a savior from our sin. Say, so how do you know that, Alan? I'm rooted in scripture. The Bible says it, and I believe it by faith. 
See, 1 John 1, 8 says, if we, claim, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Romans 3, 23 says, for we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But if, if we take the cultural bait and think that, well, there's really no sin, then we can excuse away all kinds of behaviors and jump on every desire that we have. You say, well, I wouldn't have this desire if God didn't put it in me. Really? That's an upside down world. You have that desire because you're inherently sinful. You don't want to be in my brain because you'd be appalled at some of my desires that I have to hand over to the cross of Christ and the resurrected Jesus. And that's where my hope lay. When we allow culture to inform our spiritual and moral compass uh, more often than we allow scripture to, we depart from the foundations of our faith. We mustn't be biblically light. Folks, hear me. We cannot profess to be followers of Jesus and be ignorant of the word of God. We must find regular rhythms of being informed by Scripture. And please, please, please don't let it be that the only time during the week that you hear Scripture is when you're here on a Sunday morning. My hope is always that I or whoever is up here gives you some nuggets to, to, to chew on. But, but that I, I'm quite confident that what we say in the Scripture we give you might not be pertinent to the situation that you're going to face tomorrow in the workplace, but I know God can lead you there as you take your time and your own devotions. You know, I, I know I have fallen into a bad habit here in the 21st century and um, when it comes to reading habits, and that is I've become a masterful skimmer. And, you know, and it's like if I want information about anything, what I typically do is open up about 15 tabs across my browser that all have information about what it is that I'm interested in, but I don't read the entirety of those web pages. I just find the few sentences that support what I want. And I typically do this when I want more toys to play with. And so I'll, 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 get, I'll, I'll pluck a little bit of information from this web page. See, hon, if I buy this, it says we'll actually be saving money. And then here is a, is a YouTube video that shows just how much this family benefited by buying that. If I had taken time to read the entirety of the page, I probably would have got both sides of the, uh, of the review of the argument. I can't treat the Bible like that. Just become a skimmer of God's word. And I hope you, 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 you don't fall into that habit as well. So you actually become a reader of God's word. That we actually become a people that, that stay familiar with the good old-fashioned practice of Bible study. That is one of the great benefits of the internet in the day that we live in. Is you guys have at your disposal resources that some of the old-timers used to pay thousands of dollars for. And you have them for free on the internet. Phil reminds me all the time how much money he spent on his library. And now it's just at everybody's disposal. So there are many wonderful benefits to the, the technology. I just think we can't allow our habits with skimming uh, weave it into, uh, into our way of dealing with Scripture. Well, I'll end with this today. And we'll continue down this talk next week. But um, when it comes to be rooting it, rooted in God's Word, uh, I, I, I kind of think of it as this. God, God wants us to be uh, understanders and, and readers of his word because he has something better for us than what culture offers. And my encouragement to you would be to pursue better. Pursue better than what society's offering. And then last, the parental instruction that Paul gave, I think it's just good for all of us. Pay attention to what you are allowing yourself to be influenced by. That's a good thought. We'd say that to our kids. Let's say it to ourselves. Let's stand. We'll finish up chapter 15 if you're, if you're reading along uh, as we go through next week. Um, I'd like a, a, some folks to come up and be available to uh, pray for others uh, at the end of service, if they would. Again, every week we close our service by having people available to uh, pray for you. You might have a situation uh, happening in your life's journey that uh, you're not quite sure on how to navigate it. Um, I know in my life and I know in many people's lives God has often spoke to me and worked in my life through the prayers of other people. And I think that's how God just, again, promotes unity within our community. 
Um, so sometimes, especially if you feel kind of stuck in a situation, you think, well, I've prayed. What do I need to go get prayer for someone else for? I think God reminds us through that um, activity of praying for one another, uh, the interdependence he's built into Christian community. So these guys will be available to pray for you if you'd like prayer when I dismiss. But I want to close this way. Uh, if you just close your eyes for a minute. Maybe some of you here today that uh, don't even know where you stand in terms of relationship with Jesus. Talk about being a Christian, a follower of Jesus, having sin forgiven. You think, I don't know that I've even started down that journey. You know, the penalty for my sin was death. No one told me that. But Jesus paid my penalty. Nobody told me that either. How do I get that? Well, if you're here today and you're not sure where you stand in terms of relationship with God and you want to start a journey with him, I want to lead you through a prayer right now. And just say something like this. Prayer is just conversation with God. Just say this to God in the quietness of your thoughts. God, here I am. Jesus, you got me. I don't understand, but I'm going to choose to believe today that you died for my sin, that you paid my penalty. And so, Jesus, in a sense, I'm saying, I surrender my life to you. Come into my life. Help me understand what my life's purpose is for. Why I'm here. How I can know you. Just eyes closed. I would love to confirm this moment with you. If you prayed that, would you slip your hand up so I could just see that this morning? Just for, awesome, man. You're great. Just for a second, I just want to make contact with you. It's awesome. Greatest decision of your life. So, Lord, I pray for those that will pray this prayer for the first time today, whether they are willing to acknowledge it or not, that you would now just uh, envelop them with your love, Lord, and that you would, uh, Father, begin to show them uh, who you are uh, through their, just in practical ways and in supernatural ways. Uh, Holy Spirit, just begin to show them uh, the path you've laid before them and then give them the people around them to help them down that journey. Lord, for the rest of us, I pray you would give us both uh, a desire to read your word and an understanding when we read your word. Now, some of you, maybe you feel like, man, I've read the Bible for years. I just struggle with understanding it. Lord, I pray right now through the power of the Holy Spirit for supernatural revelation. You increase our understanding. And then some of you may be here and just your gut honest, like, I don't even have a desire to read the Bible. It's okay. If you're honest, tell God. Be honest with him. He's not put off by that. But my prayer for that is, Lord, would you replace that lack of desire with an immense desire to read your word? Lord, if there's anybody that feels like, man, I've got so much attention deficit, it's just hard for me, I, I fall asleep, Lord, would you break those patterns, break those rhythms, and Lord, would you give us just the fervency to read the scripture and to apply it to our lives, Lord, so that we may, Father, be the people that you have called us to be. Thank you for this community of faith. Bless my brothers and sisters in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, guys, have a great fourth. Come get prayer if you'd like. We'll see you on the journey.